So here we are in the home dressing room at the home of cricket. This is where I used to change. Alex Stewart used to be there. Michael Atherton over there. I used to look out that window watching uh, our openers go out to bat. Nervously sat here. I was a nervous cricketer. Owen, uh, where did you change? This was your home for Middlesex and for England. Where did you change in this dressing room? Yeah, actually, funnily enough, directly across the room in that corner uh, for my whole England career. I used to sit beside Joe Root, who was the far side of the, the corner. We used to enjoy a glass of wine <laughs> <laughs> after a day's play or after a win or a loss. Um, but when I first started at Middlesex, it was over here. You know, in any change room you come into, you're always looking for the, the, the spot that the person who you've replaced fills in. And you just want to come in as, as quickly as possible and go unseen for as long as you can. Were you a superstitious cricketer? I mean, if you'd done well in a certain place, you went back and tried to change there? Well, actually, that was, that's part of the reason I used to sit in that corner, was because there's always been a TV directly in my line of sight, and I lo loved engaging with the reality of what was going on in the game. So the scoreboard was in the, in the bottom left or bottom right, and you knew exactly what was going on because you had a great view of what the ball was doing and how the batters were going, as opposed to sitting out on the balcony and riding the emotion of the game. Let's talk captaincy. You're obviously one of England's, well, England's finest captain, not one of. Um, let's talk meetings and team meetings. Where would you do your team meetings and your final Churchillian speech? Would it be in here or away from here? No, can, well, to, to start with, I actually hated team meetings and, and not for the fact that they were meetings. I, I hated the fact that you would have to put people through team meetings who despise them as much as I did. And it was a huge amount of value that you could get out of every team meeting, but you know, sports personnel or sports people uh, haven't got a great deal of concentration span <laughs> when it comes to sitting down and staying still and um, taking in information. So I always found the most effective way for the team that I led was to, to have a team meeting beside the nets and make everything relevant about what we were trying to achieve going forward at the net, so you'd have conversations with the bowlers at the end of their mark, what they're trying to achieve, and try and visualise the opposition batsmen at the same time, and trying to visualise what fields you would set and how they would counter that in many ways. But I always found that the nets were always the place that you would learn the most, and the place where people felt safe in, I I I in being vulnerable and, and, and you know trying out new things that you were potentially trying to get them to do. What about, you didn't have many, but wha what about if you had a bad day, a really bad day, where would you have your debrief there? Because I remember you told me that famous loss in Adelaide against Bangladesh. The very next day, Peter Moores called a team meeting, and you didn't agree with that. Why? No, I didn't at all. And, you know, I think that's actually where you're put in the position you are as a leader um, when times are tough. So that, that instance was we were already knocked out of the World Cup, so there was ample amount of time to reflect on the game that had passed, the game against Bangladesh where we were beaten, and we'd won more game in Sydney against Afghanistan. But I, I felt that you know, things had been extremely tough throughout that tour and throughout that World Cup that uh, you know, now wasn't always the time and that you would have the answers. It would take time to, I suppose, accept what had gone previously and then take time to also plan ahead. Um, and I would say in, in, in any other team that I played in or captained, the best debrief, the, the leaders always stood up when things were going all over the place, when the wheels were starting to come off. That was your time that your captain or coach stood up, gave a clear, direct message, uh, gave a, uh, painted a picture as to how that plan was going to unfold and, and, and how you were going to get there. Yeah, I always thought it was a really bad idea when you, when you lose a game or things go badly for you is to open it up to the change room because there'll be a million different ideas because so many other personalities that will be feeling various different things. There'll be somebody in the change room that will feel nothing and just want to move on as soon as possible. But trying to accommodate everybody within that is, is very, very difficult. So a clear, cut, concise message reiterating where you want to go and what you want to do and then accommodating different personalities once you leave the change room. What about use of uh, the an, an analyst? Uh, I mean, you used them quite a lot. You even used them on the pitch sometimes. You had messages sent out. You can get so much information from an analyst. Did you ask for specific things, or did they give you everything, and then you'd, you'd decide what you wanted to use? No, I, I asked for specific things. I think there's so much information now in the game of cricket that unless you ask the right question of the information you don't get the answer that actually contributes to you winning the game so the biggest question that I always ask 
asked and started with was what is the biggest moment in the game because as a captain or as a coach your biggest job isn't you know selection yes it plays a part but actually your biggest job throughout the game is to get your best players in the biggest moments in the game because if they're not competing in the biggest moments in the game you're already playing with one hand tied behind your back you're not competing against the opposition best player um, and, and that became interesting over the years because oh, as the shorter formats evolved so quickly and so finely, you know, the, uh, when we first started captain, it was the power play. You need to get your, your best bowlers and batters in the power play to capitalize on you know, the, the, the fielding restrictions, but also having two new balls. But now it's, it's evolved into, right, when's the opposition wrist spinner going to bowl? Or do they have an unbelievable death bowler? So you need to actually front load your batting and right off the last period of the game for certain teams that you play against. So that, that question would always move uh, and, and, and be determined by the team that you're playing against, which I, I loved and I found fascinating because you're always looking for different answers and, and different equations to try and you know, ultimately achieve the same goal. What about matchups? It's a, it's a saying that I've used on commentary more in the last couple of years than ever before. Is it as simple as you don't bowl this bowler against this batter? And can you say to the analyst, yeah, it's, it's not his matchup, but I have a gut feel that it will work today? Yeah, that, that's your captain's prerogative, really. So when you, you look at matchups and try and integrate matchups into a team, I, I can remember the transition you know, from people thinking it's absolute waffle <laughs> to you know, this is stuff that actually works. And, and, and you, you integrate it by talking about it within your own change room. Right, if you, if you had to win a game and you had to score 15 off the last over, who is the bowler you would most likely want to face? And batters, you know, again, the different characters will just throw out a big name trying to be the macho person in the change room. And some others will be very logical. They will know who they've scored consecutive or, or three boundaries in a row against. So they will work odds in their favor. And that's ultimately what matchups want to do. You, you speak to any of the death bowlers within your team, the likes of Chris Jordan, Joffre Archer, you ask who they would want to defend uh, an over or super over against, and they will give you right on point who they're most successful against. And that's what matchups is. And, and if you can integrate that in your change room and work it in your favor, there's no reason why a, a captain shouldn't do it to opposition when bringing on a bowler or sending in various different batters throughout the innings. The other thing I quite like that we had never had in our era was the grid, and we've used it a few times on Sky. You'll have a specific batter and they'll have a grid as to their strike rates in certain areas. So Kyron Pollard or something, if it's full strike rate of about 300 getting hit for anything waist high, he may struggle with. I, th that fascinates me because people do adapt. There was a, a series in India where you had the grid against Hardik Pandya and the grid said, don't bowl full to him, bowl everything around about waist high. And you did that for two games and it was brilliant. And the third game, he had obviously worked on it, was waiting for it and kept belting it over deep square. So do you feel that? Do you have to change as a batter changes? Yeah, I, th I think you adapt. I, I don't think there's any player on the planet that doesn't have a weakness. There's no, there's no player on the planet that has a well-rounded game enough that he strikes it at 200 all the way around the ground. It just, it just doesn't exist. So it's, again, it's asking the question of the, the data. Where is that area that gives him the least likely chance to hitting a boundary? And where is the area that gives you the most chance of getting that player out? So Hardik Pandey is a great example because we, we implemented that plan based on, on data. Because the guy is so good at hitting sixes, we went to the area that he was m most unlikely to hit a six. And he, he countered that. You know, any good player, again, they counter the plan that you have and you then have to try and adapt to, right, does he want you to then go back to a straight Yorker so it, it makes it easier for him to hit a six? Or is he just playing unbelievably well to counter your plan? You know, sometimes the best plan is to, is to get him off strike and get him down the other end and, and bowl at the other batter because players like that have such quality. Let's talk ground dimensions. I mean, we have two in this competition. Cardiff, short straight, you wouldn't always play your spinner there, or two spinners, is that right? That's right, yeah, no, I wouldn't. And it, it just, it, it didn't give you the best opportunity to, to take wickets. And you ha it, is, it is a stark st statistic of how short that boundary is straight. It's only a half a chip, and a half a chip off a spinner these days with, with the power that batters have is, is quite easily. So you want a guy, like, say, a Liam Plunkett, that can come in and bang the wicket hard and, and make the batter 
hit square of the wicket to the longer side, possibly against the wind. And then if they choose to hit straight, they're playing with a cross bat. So again, that gives you an opportunity to take a wicket. And the same at the Aegeus Bowl, big boundary straight. Uh, I mean, we'd, you hardly go death bowling. You have some very good death bowlers, but often you'd keep bowling it into the pitch or ask your bowlers to bowl into the pitch. Yeah, majority of the time you'd go into the wicket. The only time I, I can remember us going full is when, you know, later in the summer where the, the square is a bit more abrasive and the ball does reverse swing. That's your opportunity to go full and straight at the stumps. But... You have to use the dimensions of the ground in your favour. Again, batters are evolving, you'd say, quicker than bowlers over the last four or five years. So you need every advantage in your favour. Well, you talk dimensions. Let's look at the dimensions here today at Lords as we walk through the dressing room area. Uh, when you go out, you can see immediately that the pitch that's been used for both games today is closer to the grandstand. So Owen Morgan, the captain, arrives, looks out, what does that pitch and the dimension straight say to you straight away? Yeah, it does. So the, the, the one factor you have to uh, take in every time you play here at Lords, particularly when you're trying to hit boundaries, shorter format cricket, everybody's trying to hit fours and sixes, hitting down the slope. So from left to right, down towards the mound stand is always easier as there is just a little variation from a good length delivery when you're trying to hit it. We saw it in the, in the test match here, the Ashes test match, Ben Stokes, all of his sixes were hit down the slope and towards the mound and, and tavern stands and the first ball that he actually tried to hit up towards the grandstand he got out and it, it was a great matchup for him Hazelwood he really likes facing particularly when he's looking for a boundary but it was actually clever captaincy from Pat Cummins you know dangling that carrot of, of changing him ends and forcing him to hit up the slope and it, it paid huge dividends but today in this game, you're, you're looking at the same type of example. So it's a bit of a catch-22. It definitely will be shorter hitting that side, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be easier to hit. And it, you know, when you're standing there at the end of a bowler's mark and he's just about to run in and you sort of make, you make your plans, you shouldn't deter him from bowling hard length or her into the wicket and encourage him to hit against the slope because there's still, unless the boundary pushes out right to the edge, there is still massive margin for error when you're trying to hit to the grandstand. OK, let's um, do one of our favourite walks, actually, through the dressing room, down the stairs, through the long room, and I want to talk one of my least favourite subjects, and that's the toss, <laughs> <laughs> and how to mess up the toss. <laughs> we come out the home dressing room. First things first, while we do this walk, this great walk, were you a nervous cricketer? I was a nervous cricketer. When you were going out to bat, were you nervous? Uh, I was more anxious, I'd say, than nervous, just simply because it's, this is one of the only times that you're on your own. There's so many people that talk about cricket being an individual sport, but as a batter, you're walking the changing room until you go and see your mate that you're going to bat with. is probably the loneliest time that you're going to be as a, as a batter, uh, apart from walking off when you get out with and your the, tail, <laughs> the tail between your legs as well. And so the members as well. You have to walk through the members yeah. here, don't you? Yeah, well, I remember World Cup final. I, ca I came down here and, and, and walked through, and it was sort of, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> sorry, World Cup final. I was all about to toss to the World Cup final, sort of to scoot through the members. But it is such a special place. I love it. I've arrived here as a 16-year-old and spent my whole career here. Everything about it is just so sacred. We will come on to that toss. I just want to talk you through some of the greats of the game that have their paintings up. Michael Vaughan. Sir Ian Botham, Lord Botham, Claire Taylor, Sir Andrew Strauss, and look at that happy individual <laughs> there. All the greats of the game. Nasser Hussain with a massive smile on his face. Where's the Owen Morgan portrait? No, there's not one. <laughs> there must there's be a World Cup winning captain. No, there's not. There's not at all. Get one done. So here we are in the long room. Let's go back to that World Cup final. I, I was out there in the middle waiting for you. It had been exactly the same sort of morning as this. It had rained. The start had been delayed. Did you know when you were walking through here exactly what you were going to do, whether you were going to bat or bowl? Well, it's actually one of the first times in my career walking out as captain that I wasn't 100% sure on what I was going to do. Um, Sorry, was that a problem in any way? Yeah, it, As in it for just your team or anything uh, on such a big occasion? Not for the team. We had a bit of a rain, rain delay. As you know, the, the toss was delayed by about 15 or 20 minutes, and that allowed you just to, to, to seek out, you know, head coach, um, a couple of players that have played here for years. But again, the, the, they came back to me and said, you've played here for 20 years. Why are you coming to us? for an answer and, and that sort of gave me reassurance and confidence within the decision that I would have made and I think if I was forced to make a decision you know the conditions were in such in a bowling first favour I was a little bit surprised that New Zealand 
batted for us, but again, they, they played towards their strength. They wanted to get a, a score on the board and, and try and defend it. But walking through here again, trying to get through a couple of the members, I, I wasn't 100% sold, but by the time I, I got out there, I think I would have had a solid What, what advice would you give to um, young captains, um, school, club, cricket? You know, most of the time batters want to bowl and bowlers want to bat. What would you say as they rock up to a pitch and look down at a pitch? What advice would you give them with the toss of the coin? Yeah, here I, I think it's quite simple. If, 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 if it's good and hard, you know, bat first. If it's not, you, sh you should have a look at bowling. The only time that you should rule those decisions out is if your team has had some success with one or the other. So even if it was a green top and you batted first and had success batting first, continue to do that. There are so many people that hand out advice like us two do all the time about what you should and shouldn't do, but you have to listen to how your team performs. You know, in, in the 100 last year here at the London Spirit, we got in a, a running form of, of winning the toss and batting first. And that happened just by pure fluke. We lost one of the first tosses in one of the first games that we played and ended up defending a score. And that became the confidence booster that we needed to kick on in the tournament. So listen to your team and how they perform would be my advice. Let's talk captains, captains you admired. Who, who would you say is the best captain you've seen? Best captain I've played with and seen, without doubt, is Sir Andrew Strauss. Um, I made my test debut under him, also my one day debut under him. And just he, every time he gave a team talk, I wanted to address a player. He was all relatable, always relatable, very empathetic. Uh, and he was also a great, great listener. Um, and that doesn't even count the, the performances that he's put in over the years. But in, as an all round leader, I've always admired him and, and actually stolen some of his tricks of the trade that how he used to lead um, to try and use them more effectively in, in my leadership. And in present day, either in this tournament, men or women, or generally in world cricket, who, who do you think, mm, I think he's going to be a very good captain, he or she? Yeah, here, I think it's brilliant. I think this, plat this tournament gives a huge platform to young leaders coming through. Uh, I'd say in, in the world game at the moment, Joss Butler is, is a fine, fine leader. You know, I, I worked alongside him in captain vice captain role for a very long time and just his clarity in decision making and his embodiment of that message that he's trying to get across the whole time is 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 unparalleled alongside anybody else at the moment in the hundred at the moment i, I actually love watching heather knight and how she operates she she doesn't seem to change from her england hat on to a london spirit she missed last year's campaign which she, she was devastated about so she'll be looking to make a huge impact this year and I'd say in the men's game James Vince for a long long time has been a brilliant brilliant leader both for Hampshire and the Southern Brave it embodies a, a calm natured good decision maker and also contributes massively at the top of the order. Well it is fascinating how captaincy has changed over the years in my era it was just turn up have a bit of gut feel we had a scorer with us that's all we had on tour Present captains and recently retired captains have so much information that they've got to take in and work out what to use. One thing is for certain that in cricket, captaincy is vital, as this man has shown.